to Wesley United Methodist Church in Concord, New Hampshire, where we grow with God so that we can go to serve. I'm Reverend Cheryl Meachin, and today is Sunday, April 25th, 2021. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our members and visitors joining us in worship here together this morning and encourage you to sign our virtual clipboard at the link provided in the YouTube chat below or to call our church office at 603-224-7413. You're also always welcome to visit our website at conquerwumc.org so that you can get connected, so that you can learn about our mission and ministry to the Concord community, and so that you can join one of our small groups to grow in your faith and fellowship with others. Here at Wesley United Methodist Church, we've taken the stand to do no harm. We won't be meeting in person for worship until it is safe to do so for our large congregation. Even though you see me here in person at the church again, I am the only one here this morning. We are going to continue offering our services via YouTube and even virtually beyond the time of the pandemic. But we are this summer going to have an experiment with having parking lot services where you can park as if you're coming to a drive-in, sit comfortably in your car and tune your radio to hear those of us on the steps of the church as we share worship. The first such service is going to be a celebration of our intern, Jen Savoy. Jen is graduating seminary next month. And she's been with us for this past academic year. I hope that you've had a chance to meet her, and I hope that you'll come and help us send her on her way. You'll be invited to participate in a ritual where you, you can share a message with Jen and say a brief goodbye as you drive away. It's only going to be about a half hour or so, and it's really important that you participate with us here. I also would like to remind you that I do a daily devotional on Facebook at 7 a.m. each morning, and I invite you to check that out. See you at the plant sale on May 15th from 7 to 1. We'll be holding our plant sale fundraiser this year in a socially distant and masked manner. We invite you to pre-order your plants at conquerwumc.org slash plant dash sale. You can do that by submitting your payment directly and that form directly, or by printing the form out and mailing it in, or by calling our church office, again, 603-224-7413, to ask that a form be mailed to you. If you'd like to volunteer, we need some staff to help set up, to help bring plants to people's cars. We could use a few pop-up tents, some wagons, and the Scouts will be having their regular yard sale 
So they're looking for donations. If you'd like to send anything their way, you can contact Ben Venator at his email address at yahoo.com, or you can volunteer by contacting Teresa Belden at gmail.com to help out in that way. As always, we invite you to share this service by sharing it on your social media or telling someone about it on CCTV Channel 22 throughout the week. Someone who needs a word of hope and encouragement. Hello, everyone. Miss Christina here with a quick announcement reminding you to tune in to Wesley's YouTube channel this Friday, April 30th at 6 p.m. for our third messy church. Get ready for some fun. <laughs> it seems to have really taken off, and I hope you join us for fun this Friday at 6 on Wesley's YouTube channel. See you then. And now I invite you to create a sacred space where you are as we come into this time of worship in prayer. Beloved one, you are a protector, a healer, a friend. You place feasts before the hungry and welcome strangers with shelter. Come and deepen our capacity to practice love that is as substantial as yours. Amen.
Let us now read responsibly the call to worship. How do we come to know the love of God? Not through word or speech alone. The love of God is truth and action, embodied and incarnate, tangibly turning the world on end. God's love is bold and brave manifesting materially that life may thrive today. God's presence is a force. Love is felt. Love is witnessed. Love is experienced and encountered. Thanks be to God who dwells in the flesh of the kind and the just. Let us now sing hymn number 381, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. for the children to come forward and get all comfy cozy. Are y'all good? <laughs> Are you doing well in this fourth Sunday of Easter? I hope you've had a wonderful week and are ready for another fun week ahead. <laughs> all right, so today we're talking about something really neat. We're talking about shepherds today. Now my first question to you, do you guys recognize who this lady is right here? That's right. She's our pastor, Pastor Cheryl. Now, what does she have to do with sheep? <laughs> well, fun fact first. Do you know that the word pastor is an old Latin word that means shepherd? Wow, really cool. Because you want to know who else was a shepherd? 
take a look at this. <gasps> That's right. Jesus was also a shepherd, <laughs> a shepherd of sheep right here, and also a shepherd of disciples and followers, right? Now, you'll see in his hand, he's got his shepherd's crook. Um, that's what that staff is that shepherds use to corral their sheep and guide their sheep when they start to go astray and need a little guidance and help and support. Um, that sounds an awful like what Pastor Cheryl does, right? She guides and supports us and helps us when, you know, when we need a little extra guidance, support, or help, she's there, right? Now, she may not have a crook like Jesus had in his hand in that picture, but guess what her guiding crook is? It's the Bible, right? Isn't Jesus or the Bible always the answer? <laughs> but no, her guide is the Bible. Now, in the Bible, we know that Jesus says that the Lord is my shepherd, right? But God called Jesus to be a shepherd as well. And where Jesus is no longer on earth with us, um, he has also called our pastors, particularly for us, Pastor Cheryl, to be our shepherd and to guide us. So for when we go astray and go off on the wrong path, she uses the Bible to help us, right? And to help us figure out what to do in tricky situations or sad or hard situations. She helps us in happy situations too, right? She helps us know the right thing to do through the word of God, okay? So... We are all thankful for Jesus and the good shepherd who has led us this far. And we always know that we can use that Bible and his teachings to help us, right? All right, let us pray. Dear God, we are thankful for Jesus. And we are thankful for Pastor Cheryl. We know them and they know us. Jesus laid down his life for us. We also thank you that you have called them to be our shepherds in life. And all God's children say, amen. All right, so I have a special song to help us wrap up this morning. It's called Jesus Loves the Little Children. If you know this one, feel free to sing along, right? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Have a great week ahead, everyone. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. The scripture this morning is from John, chapter 10, 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own knows me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the story of faith and faithful struggle.
Thanks be to God. And now we come to the time of the sermon, the proclamation of the word. And let us be together in a spirit of prayer. O Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our salvation. And may we, like Samuel, cry out and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen. Gail Page, our liturgist this week, has just read the text that is generally known as the story of the Good Shepherd. In this scripture, Jesus describes himself as a shepherd. For people in the United States today, the idea of sheep or shepherd is somewhat beyond our reality, especially in the cities and the urban centers in the working world. While there are farmers who raise and herd sheep here in this nation, there are more of us who don't experience sheep in our daily life as they did in Jesus' time. In fact, in most children's literature, in the illustrations, Jesus is depicted as smiling, tall, thin, a white man with a staff, surrounded by fluffy sheep. The sheep, somehow aware of who he is, smile in his presence. They too are joyful. But this is a cartoon interpretation. Shepherds smell like sheep, and sheep smell like outside, like grass, like dirt, like sweat, like rain, like whatever they were just chewing on. I can personally attest to this. Here's a photo of me in the Holy Land with the bishop in 2018. We were at the shepherd's field and we sang the shepherds watch their flocks by night. This was the place where the shepherds were watching their flocks and heard of the birth of Jesus from the angels. And so we were invited by a local man to hold a sheep for a dollar. And this sweetly smiling guy was pretty stinky and so was I for the rest of that day. Even more, sheep are not always the docile, fluffy white creatures of the cartoon image of children's books. They will fight for dominance. They will throw themselves at each other at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour. And this goes on for hours, often until one ram gives up and walks off. Luckily, these creatures have protective skills skulls that keep them from truly injuring themselves. And Jesus is there for all of it. Centuries of nursery rhymes and children's books have taught us to think of sheep as soft and fluffy creatures. But in the wild, they fight. They compete for limited resources. The bigger ones take advantage of the smaller ones. They challenge each other to the point of boxing matches. And Jesus is there for all of it. In one of the most famous vignettes of his life, Jesus intervenes in a true clash. Although to call it a clash would be to mute the power differential in this example, a woman is about to be stoned by the town, for she, herself alone, was caught in adultery. Can you see the irony there? It takes two. But Jesus puts his body on the line and interrupts the violence. He doesn't allow himself to be a bystander, although he easily could have enjoyed the privilege of manhood and walked by. Instead, he stops the scene. He pushes those with stones to reflect on what they're getting ready to do. If anyone here is without sin, let him be the one to cast the first stone. Everyone dropped their stone at the sound of his voice. What a voice. And they will listen to my voice, the scripture says. They did on that day. To serve as a shepherd, one must be wise. One must also be willing to take on the burden of the ones they serve. As scripture states, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And again, later in Matthew, Forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And to the person hanging beside Jesus in his last hours, he says, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus goes out of his way from beginning to end to show people that he's not here to get a check and bounce. He's not detached from the people. When he says, how are you, he stays for the answer. Jesus invests emotionally into the care of these sheep. He understands that part of the job description means that you will have to fight off some wolves. He promises to connect the sheep outside of the fold into this one. He promises to put these cohorts of sheep together, thus strengthening their potential for solidarity and cooperative living. And yet he is not the center of this story. Jesus is just stewarding an already living and breathing ecosystem. As shepherd, he's only supporting a community that already exists without him. But we cannot ignore that in this scripture, the shepherd who protects also sacrifices. The scripture reminds us that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Many writers have drawn the connection between Jesus as sacrifice and other black people killed by the state. Seven last words services have been happening on Good Friday for a few years in Christian communities, including ours last year with the Greater Concord Interfaith Council, featuring not the words of Christ, but the words of black people today who have been killed by police officers and vigilantes. Poet Crystal Valentine chillingly asked how anyone could doubt the blackness of Christ when he died in the blackest way possible, with his hands up, with his mother watching. The late Dr. James Cone wrote an incredible text called The Cross and the Lynching Tree in which he draws the very clear line between the terrors of the cross and the tree on which so many young black men were hung. The parallel is glaring. As Christians, we ought to be accountable to the straight line from the forces that killed Jesus and the forces that continue to kill black people today. How and when, though, does that parallel become more perpendicular, as in meeting at certain intersections and then never meeting again? What distinguishes Jesus from so many of these others is consent. The scripture records Jesus saying, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Sadly, among even progressive Christians, we see blood sacrifice as a transaction worth honoring. In a sermon preached at Bethany Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson recounted a white person telling her that George Floyd was the wake-up call we needed. What does it do in the imaginations of Christians across the world to believe that God requires a transaction to settle the score? How does it do harm to the very people who give of themselves unwillingly? Why does it consistently take sacrifice? And why are the same people being used as sacrifices? As James Baldwin offered in the documentary, The Price of the Ticket, what is it you wanted me to reconcile myself to? He says, I was born here almost 60 years ago. I'm not going to live another 60 years. You always told me it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time. How much time do you want for your progress? 
As myself, a white woman of some privilege, I cannot possibly answer those questions, even to my own satisfaction. And so I share with you the words of Candace Simpson, the associate pastor at the Concord Baptist Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York, who says, when the most dominant and dominating idea of a major religion in the United States centers on the idea of substitutionary atonement, of transactional justice, of judgment, of one life for another, involuntary surrogacy, we can only expect that on systemic levels there is a lack of compassion and tenderness. We can expect the violence of carceral logic. We can expect the violence of ableism that sacrifices the elderly and the immunocompromised. Immediately after the November election, she goes on, and after the runoff in January, people made t-shirts and hashtags saying, black women will save us. Thinking of Vice President Kamala Harris and Georgian politician and activist Stacey Abrams. But no black woman signed up to be the sacrifice. At best, these particular black women that we gesture toward are attempting to save their own lives. And in the process, others get saved too. As the Combahee River Collective was clear to say, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. In James Cleveland's classic Good Friday song called He Decided, the choir reminds us Jesus would not come down from the cross just to save himself. He decided to die just to save me. The key, so, the key word in that song is decided. There were moments when Jesus could have bowed out of the task and dispatched angels to surround him. But in vignettes like this, we get the sense that the power of resurrection depends on a willing sacrifice. Given his simultaneous divinity, it might not even be fair to put Jesus' sacrifice on the same level as others. His actual parent is God, who has that kind of cushion and support. No one wants to be surrendered to the hands of a police officer, to coronavirus, to imperialism, to violence. I've heard people thanking George Floyd for his sacrifice, but it wasn't his idea to die that day. And it certainly wasn't the desire of his family. We must interrogate the ways we turn tragic events into aha moments for our own enlightenment. Whose body have we placed on the cross for our salvation? Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift of enlightenment and awareness through the precious scripture that we study. Amen. And now friends, as we come into this time of prayer, let us begin by celebrating the happy birthdays of some of our members and friends. This week we're celebrating Aaron Bernardo, Alan Schulte, and Lily Mae Schulte. Happy birthday, friends. And as we continue in this time of prayer together, let us lift some of the concerns that are facing many of our members at this time. We've heard a prayer concern from Donna Osborne, for Mary Eliasson back at home following a COVID diagnosis and hospitalization, and for her mother's need for back surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Myrna Hanna, who is recovering from knee surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For George and the family of Helen Fryer, who passed away on Easter Sunday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Al Sidney, who has been diagnosed with blood cancer, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Arlene Little, who is in rehab, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Bill Broderick, 
who has been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Ken Gallagher's mom, for ongoing health issues, and for Ken and Sharon as they travel to see her this coming week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Cindy Nix, for ongoing back issues. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Larry Haynes, who has been diagnosed with kidney cancer and is healing from a broken arm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Dick Hart's daughter, Caroline, who is an EMT in Chicago, and for all first responders and medical professionals who are dealing on the front lines with this terrible disease. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Wesley's special ministries, for Family Promise, the Concord Coalition to End Homelessness, Abbott Downing School, Second Start Alternative High School, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our children and youth programs and our messy church offering, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our missionaries, Judy Daka, for her ministry in Zambia, for Belinda Forbes and her dental ministry in Nicaragua, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our Bishop Sudarshana Devadar, our District Superintendent Taesan Kang, myself, your pastor Cheryl Meachin, our staff, our volunteer church leaders, and each member and friend of Wesley. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day for those everywhere, for those who are hurting, for those who are sick, for those who are afraid, for those who are hungry, for those who are homeless, for those who are oppressed, for those who are anxious in the midst of this time. We pray especially for the family of George Floyd following the conviction of his murderer. We pray for justice in this world. And let us pray together the words that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we come into a time of offering, a time where we bring our tithes, our gifts, our widow's mites to the altar, even in this virtual time when we're offering them by mail to 79 Clinton Street, Concord, New Hampshire, 03301, or by sending them via our electronic means through our website at concordwumc.org slash donate. As we consider our gifts, our pledges, let us pray together. As one community, we hope to meet the needs of one another and our neighbors. We aim to practice love that is neither abstract nor superficial, but instead love that lightens burdens and shares responsibility with commitment to living out our beliefs. Let us bring what we have together at this time. Amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. come together in prayer, dedicating our gifts to God. God, you concern yourself with the cause of the suffering, the fears and exhaustion of the persecuted, and the safety of the vulnerable. We hope to be so faithful in our priorities, striving to center the most pressing needs around us. For all the ways your love meets us in our times of struggle, we bring our gifts with thanks to you. Amen. And now let us sing together hymn number 2212, My Life Flows On. draws to a close. I'd like to invite you to join us for a time of fellowship on Zoom. 
If you're watching on YouTube on Sunday morning, we gather around 1130 at the link that's provided in the chat screen below. We just talk for a few moments, greeting one another and talking about life. It's not very long, a half hour or so, and we'd love to have you join us. Let us be in a spirit of prayer as I share the benediction. The spirit of Christ rises to meet the needs of a world in pain, a world threatened by violence and exploitation, by a refusal to change, by condemnation and greed, the groans of the earth, the precious lives of all people, the possibilities of genuine cooperation and collaboration, they depend on the manifestation of a radical love, bold, bodily, baptismal. May it become so among us. Amen. Please join us again next week at 1030 here on our YouTube channel. And please remember that it will be Communion Sunday and to bring an element of fruit like juice and an element of grain like bread. God bless you.